I'm really excited to announce our last, but absolutely not the least, keynote speakers, uh, Roger Ping and Hilary Parker, the hosts of uh, Not So Standard Deviations. If you've never heard of it before, really fantastic podcast. Uh, they've never invited me to be a guest speaker, but <laughs> fortunately, I'm not bitter about that at all. Uh, but seriously, I'm very long-term uh, fans of Roger and Hillary. Uh, Roger has been a very uh, a supporter of the Tidyverse, really, before it was the Tidyverse. And I think his USR 2018 keynote does a better job of kind of articulating the philosophy and the benefits of the Tidyverse than I've ever managed. I'm also very fortunate to call uh, Hillary uh, a friend. Uh, Hillary is a, f a fantastic data scientist. I've had a number of really insightful conversations with her. One recent one which led me to really understand like one of the things that I do is design. But as well as being a data scientist at uh, Stitch Fix, Hillary, I'm also very lucky that Hillary is, has acted as my stylist and she actually just picked out the clothes I'm wearing today. <laughs> So I'd like you to please join me in welcoming uh, Hillary and Roger. All right. Okay, so you're going to get a little behind the scenes action here because uh, <laughs> the listeners of our show don't see this, but we have to do this every time. You know, when you're dealing with a high stakes situation like this, safety comes first. Yeah. Right? So. Um, we have a checklist that we go through every time. So uh, we're gonna go through the checklist. Uh, okay, Hillary, hardwired? Yeah. I guess we don't really need that. <laughs> VPN turned off? Yeah, my work VPN yeah. causes problems with our a number connection. Of yes. Wi-Fi turned off? No. We don't need, oh, actually I haven't turned off my Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, reboot your router? Yeah. <laughs> Almost always my internet is the yeah, issue. It's usually yeah, it's yeah. Um, verify microphone. I think the people in the back, they seem to know what they're doing. Um, verify recording. We are recording. Um, all right. Hardwired. I'm not recording today. Uh, I was being written. I'm not doing that. Verify. We did once do a whole podcast episode where we did not record. That's right. Yeah. So once that happened, like guess, never guess again. Guess how that made it onto the checklist. Yeah. <laughs> We did a blameless postmortem. Uh, levels I, seem to be okay. Yeah. All right, and it is close to five o'clock. Yeah. So um, verify you, that my cat's been. You fed your cat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she does. Like from four to five, she starts to interrupt things. That was more of an issue in, when you were in Melbourne. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so, all right. So I think we're go for launch. Yeah. All right. Go for launch. So uh, welcome to Not So Standard Deviations, this is episode one hundred. <laughs> Uh, I'm Roger Pang from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm here with Hillary Parker of Stitch Fix. Um, this <laughs> so this episode is our first ever live episode. Yeah. Um, it's I guess ironically not going to be about R or our studio. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it's possible we showed up at the wrong conference. <laughs> um, but uh, but I think I hope you'll enjoy it. I think it'll be fun. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also did some prep, like, <laughs> unusually. Uh, usually we kind of show up and call each other and say, I was thinking about talking about this, and so this time we actually have some materials. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right, so I thought there are probably a few people in the audience who haven't heard of or heard our podcast, so I thought we thought we'd just talk a little bit about kind of why we're here, what we're doing, why we're doing this. Um, and uh, so I guess this started in 2015, right after the R OpenSci uh, unconference here in San Francisco, um, where Hillary and I kind of caught up. Uh, and I sent her an email. I said, hey, uh, I think the subject of the email was, I want to broadcast your opinions to the world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because, you know, Hillary has a few opinions. <laughs> and I thought, there's, there's nothing the internet likes more than a strongly opinionated person, right? <laughs> So um, anyway, I sent her an email and said, hey, I think we could do a data science podcast. The, I don't think there's exactly what I'm thinking about out there already in terms of other data science podcasts. Um, and so, you know, do you want to do it? And uh, so she got back to me. She said yes. 
And I sent her a wall of text email saying, here's what I think we should do. And then there was no response. <laughs> yeah. But then. A week later, I apologized a lot. Yes. And it was true that my boss quit that week. So yeah. there was like some reason, but yeah, it was mostly the wall of text. But yeah. so but yes. And then we just went for it. Yeah, for five years. And so, or almost five years, I should say. Yeah. Um, so 99 episodes. Yeah. And so here we are. So we've been talking about a lot of things. Um, and one of the things that, uh, over the past five years, and one of the things that we realized as we we're preparing well, for this keynote is that we have like a record of everything we've said. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I wanted to make sure there was a visual impact here. But um, I actually printed out the transcripts of every episode <laughs> and leaf through them um, because it's kind of rare that you have the ability to see what you were thinking over a period of time like this, aside from kind of like a personal journal. Yeah. Which I have joked that the podcast is a little bit of like a personal journal. But, um, but yeah, so we wanted to look back and see what themes were coming up. And, you know, we kind of... We never set out with an agenda for this, although I kind of thought no. you did at first, but um, we just wanted to chat. And then what was surprising was that we actually got some places during these chats. And so part of the, the reason I wanted to look back through these transcripts was to see how thoughts evolved over time. So just bef before we uh, move on to the next thing, I sort of mentioned, yeah, as we were kind of leading up to this keynote, uh, you know, they asked us to do this a while back. You know, and we saw kind of who else was going up. You know, so I mean, I think, for, so for example, JJ's keynote yeah. uh, yesterday was, you know, was amazing. Yeah. Um, and a lot, uh, and you know, maybe coincidentally or not, touched on <laughs> a lot of themes that we had been discussing in terms of open source and. Yeah. Uh, and um, and for those of you who are wondering, we're not going to talk about that. Yeah, here. we're not going to talk about open source at all. So, so even though our episodes have been leading up to that, and again, we like may have had some information there uh, that emboldened those conversations, but... Um, Look out for episode 101. Yeah, episode 101, we'll get back on track with that. But um, yeah, I was, we wanted to touch on those. The keynotes have been awesome so far. Right. Uh, and especially, I mean, JJ's was really good, and we were joking about the fact that uh, didn't realize what a nerd he was. <laughs> <laughs> or what, like, a policy nerd yeah. he was. <laughs> I, I told him it, it warmed my heart when he brought up the case history of the Delaware Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, you know, nothing more riveting. Yeah. Than, <laughs> nothing more riveting than a little bit of corporate case law, you know? <laughs> exactly. So. But, and it's just so lucky that someone who, like, had so much interest in public policy but then became, like, a highly productive coder for yeah. many years and then like circled back and brought them together like it, it's unusual so <laughs> um and then yeah the uh the second keynote with all that data visualization like really spoke to me um because at Citrix I work a lot with outfit data there's a lot of imagery and fashion right and so um I was really inspired by that about like different ways to visualize the data um and actually JJ also was talking about this like um the book was called uh, Shop Class of Soulcraft. And like this idea of like touching the data and like making the data yourself. And looking through this transcript, actually, you had mentioned um, Scott Zeger talking about like writing the data down by hand. And so I just, I thought that was awesome. And that actually see. comes from uh, John Tukey, who talks about scratching the numbers down. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, there you yeah. go. So I have uh, to say, when I, we saw that the two, peop uh, the, the two people from Google were going to talk at the keynote, we didn't know what it was going to be, but I was like, oh, that one's going to be good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so They're going to be like, very polished, do? very prepared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, let's do the opposite. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> run in the opposite direction of whatever they do. Yeah. yeah. That was where the idea of the live episode came yes. from. Yeah. Like, and then Jenny's talk was great, too. Yeah. Um, was, uh, she always has an amazing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She, she has an incredible ability to just kind of see that higher level of stuff after having been in the trenches for so long. Exactly, yeah, yeah. like going into the detail and understanding the nitty gritty, but then being able to zoom out and like create the paradigm for it. Yeah. It's like not easy, so yeah. good work. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too comfortable though. Yeah. Um. No, but I feel like this conference has been awesome and we have like, we have fodder for like many episodes. Yes. Like going, following up on this yeah. stuff, so. And such um, a great vibe. <laughs> this is your first. This is my first yeah. R Studio Conf. Yes, right. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, 
So cool. we went through the, so one of the ideas that we had for this keynote was to kind of go through our thought process for the last five years, mm -hmm. and which is made a lot easier by looking at the transcripts, listening to the audio, hearing what we've been talking about. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the things, as we did that in preparation, um, it, we noticed a number of kind of interesting moments, of course, and kind of re recurring themes. Yeah. Um, one of, the, one of the interesting moments that we had actually early, early on in the podcast was our first and only really kind of use of profanity. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, maybe I just want to ask, maybe do a quick poll. Who thinks it was me and who thinks it was Hillary? Who thinks it was Hillary? <laughs> wow. Who thinks it was me? <laughs> About 50-50. All right, let yeah. me play this, uh, this clip. People use spreadsheet sheets. <laughs> They're trying to avoid like syntax bullshittery and yeah. like, data structure bullshittery. Because we have a lot of that in any scripted language where you have to know a fair amount of syntax and get fairly facile with data structures. Thank you, Jenny Bryan. <laughs> <laughs> It was a really popular episode. It was. Where you were. Yeah. It was like super early days, and Jenny was defending spreadsheets, essentially, or like like uh, like talking about having empathy. With Explaining the attraction of spreadsheets. Yeah. I yeah. Think. yeah. Uh, another theme. One of the most controversial things I think we've ever discussed on the podcast um, involves this topic here. And I want to point out that you got an oatmeal raisin cookie. What is the problem? <laughs> You're like the tenth person who's like. Just called me out of that. They're terrible. Like, why does anyone choose them? This... They're delicious. No. All right. Are you between? Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to have to enjoy them in private. Right? <laughs> that's, yeah, as you should. That, that's like a dagger in the heart. Yeah. As you should, yeah. Oatmeal cookies, to this day, get us a lot of feedback. Yeah. And, um, Terrible. Um, and apparently, there's a, a lot, a, whole, a huge plate of them outside, you know, ready for ready for me to eat. <laughs> it's just no one else wants them. I also love that episode we literally recorded in a Jimmy John. <laughs> That's right. Like that was we like met. I was in town for my brother's wedding, yep. and we like met in the middle between DC. My brother lives in DC, and we met in the middle between DC and Baltimore, like at a Jimmy John's That's and right. recorded it. And you ordered an oatmeal raisin. That's cream. right. Yeah. Yeah. And hence the interesting soundtrack. In the yeah. There. <laughs> um, the other kind of one recurring theme that we have that has played out over multiple episodes is Hillary trying to get me to do stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so one of those things is uh, getting Netflix, apparently. Yeah. So here's my only problem actually is that I don't have, uh, I don't have Netflix. Oh, come on, you can shell out for, uh, like, like, it's, it's like $8 a month, Roger. That's yeah, episode that's three. Episode three. Yeah. Episode 28. Oh, the other piece of news that's really important is that I finally got Netflix. Uh, and 28 is like a year later, right? Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, because yeah. we do once every two months, so yeah. it took you a while. Two weeks, yeah. Yeah, oh, two, yeah, yeah. once every two weeks, so. Uh, episode 36. So if you have access to HBO, Highly recommend. Oh, HBO. Okay. Now you, you're like, I have to buy another service? <laughs> yeah. I bought Netflix for you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this one's an HBO exclusive. Yeah. All right. It's $14.99 a month. <laughs> I'll just the cost. So we went from 8 to $14.99. Yeah. I just kind of wonder what I'm going to have to pay next. And then episode 70. Yeah. Are they on Netflix? Uh, I would assume so. I don't know. Who knows what's on Netflix these days? <laughs> so apparently I wasn't really watching it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, okay, so this is, I have some follow-up, which is that, <laughs> so I have some notes here. Episode 6, you say, I love movies. Okay. Episode 13, you say, I'm a film nerd. <laughs> and then, uh, like, many times, you talked about this script book thing, which was, like, predicting whether a movie would be successful based on its script. Right. Like, al like algorithms for doing that. And then Walt Hickey came on, and you, like, read his blog post about, like, books versus movies, and you know about Steven Spielberg table reads? Yeah. I, wanna, I feel like I want the visual of, like, handing you. <laughs> like, like, here's all the times you've talked about what? movies, but, like, do you not watch movies? Like, how does this work? <laughs> Like, are you just interested in movies, like, intellectually and never watch them? I just, I infer their content. 
<laughs> no, but I, like, I really want the answer here. Yeah. Like, do you watch Netflix? This isn't an act. This isn't yeah, Netflix, no. Yeah. Um, you know, things have slowed down in terms of my <laughs> movie watching activity. But you enjoy, like, the craft. I do. Yeah, yeah. so, okay. So that, <laughs> that's just weird. I just want you to know that. So noted. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the transcripts like really brought that home for me because yeah. I uh, I had never like put those yeah. together, and I didn't realize you said early on that you were a film nerd. You're like, I love living in LA, or you lived in LA in, in yeah. grad school. So. Yeah. Anyway, so those were kind of like our fun uh, going back and recurring themes. But what we really wanted to talk about was this kind of overarching theme that actually Hadley kind of uh, alluded to, which is the idea of uh, the role of design and data science. And um, we one, this was something we chewed on for so long, of essentially like how do you do data analysis? Um, and one thing that really struck me looking at it was that literally in episode one, we talk about it a lot, and actually, for a long time, I thought that this was why you wanted to do the podcast, <laughs> was like to solve this problem. I had no agenda. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it is, yeah, it is surprising to look at that first transcript to see how many plant seeds were planted. Exactly. Yeah. Like, we actually talked about, we, we hit words and themes that were like, were kind of where we got to, but I don't think we had a way of recognizing that those were going to be important at the time. So we have three clips yeah. from episode one. Just to be clear, we started this episode talking about our cat ladies. Yeah, that's right. right. So <laughs> agenda was not super strong. Yeah, yeah, and our cat lady, this is like a little dated at this point, but it was like this hashtag for like seeing your cat on your keyboard while you were writing R, <laughs> which happens to me all the time. And the, anyway. Yeah. So anyway, this is from the first episode. We have this habit of like telling people, like giving people a bunch of choices, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could do this, you could do that, you could do regression, you could do smoother, you could do, you know, whatever. Just pick, there's like five different models that you could, you know, or strategies right. that you could implement. Uh, but we often don't like tell people how to choose between those yeah, types of definitely. things. You know, like, like that's almost like, it's almost like we explicitly don't do it. <laughs> The recording quality in the early days was... I know. You can really tell from these clips the variance in my recording quality, <laughs> yeah. like, personally. Yeah. But um, let me just put these down. <laughs> Thump. Um, but yeah, like, so you had, to set that clip up a little bit more, you'd, like, had an experience teaching a stat class right. where at the end someone essentially said to you, like, as a statistician, you, I think you did a good job of telling me things to do, and you told me things, definitely things not to do, uh, but now how do I know what to do? Right. Yeah. Basically, like, thanks for teaching me all this stuff. I still don't know anything. Yeah. So, I still know nothing, and I still fact, know, like, you sent me down with the data set. I don't know, like, how to proceed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This person, and this person got an A in the class. This is, you know, yeah. by far and away. And, and my favorite part about that, too, is that you kind of set it up as like, you like, you were like, good point. And it was the second to last lecture. Right. So you like go to your office and like sit down yeah. and try to like write it out. Like, okay, here's what to do. Here's what data analysis is in one lecture. Yeah. Like, here's um, how to craft the perfect analysis. Yeah. It didn't Done. work. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't work. Uh, I, can't, I think I came away with a few bullet points. Of yeah. Point. Um, yeah, you know, I had a lot more thinking to do, apparently. That was about, I guess, 10 years ago now. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so the second one, second clip. So is, I was thinking oh, when you were sorry. saying that is that, like, part of a <laughs> successful data analysis is convincing someone of something. And that's, like, that is inherently, like, a one-on-one -on -one process. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we touched on, like, this... Like, what does success look like? Right. Yeah, like, that was kind of what this woman was getting at. It's like, okay, I have to do something. I have to accomplish something. Like, what is that thing? And how do I decide how to do it? Right. Yeah. yeah. And we don't, we don't touch the how to decide at all, but at least we started to, like, circle around what does it look like to, to do this thing that we talk about that this whole conference is about. And recognizing that human beings are involved. Yeah, yeah, and humans are involved. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's to lead into the right. third clip. I think it's this human element that, that, you know, that is missing, I think, from a lot of, kind of talk about data analysis. It's hard. And actually, that gets into like, the next topic of, kind of like, who's building successful tools. And I think it has yeah. a lot to do with like, people who genuinely have empathy with the user. Yeah. So that was empathy. I feel like it was a little. But um, yeah, like, these were, again, kind of things we threw out and didn't think about for a long time. but ended up being central themes to what we were talking about later. Yep. Yeah. 
So um, that's episode one. Yeah, episode one covered that. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. So like throughout, so we kind of have this like timeline of what this looked like, like evolving over time. And one of the things, and again, this was like four and a half years ago, I was still working at Etsy, and Etsy had um, this kind of amazing DevOps team. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, DevOps stands for Developer Operator. And it's this, it's this field where um, essentially it was like kind of taking IT to the next level. So it was the same, the people who run the website, the people who keep the servers on for the website, the people who do everything to kind of keep this you know, shopping website up, they should also be the people developing the tools to keep the website up. Um, and so it's like developer operator. And, um, and at Google, they kind of have a different word for it, site, reliabil site reliability engineer, but it's the same thing. And um, I was really inspired by that work um, and kind of how they approach problems. One of the central tenets was this idea of a blameless postmortem, where if you ran into a problem, like let's say your system failed and the website went down, um, there was a t there is a, t a human tendency to like blame the person who wrote the code that failed or whatever. But Etsy focused a lot on instead doing this thing called a blameless postmortem, where you talk about um, like you you frame the problem as though the system failed that operator rather than the operator failing within a good system. And then that opens up the conversation to like to talk about iterating on the system and saying, you know, okay, this person went to work this day, said they wanted to do a good job, they did not say they wanted to take down the website, but then the system like allowed them to take down the website. Um, and so like based on this kind of idea of like how do we know what to do, there were sort of these two threads that started. One was how do we decide like how to build the artifact, like the dashboard or the email or the report, whatever. And then there was this kind of like how do you build a narrative. Um, and so I think like the theme of the early part of the podcast really for the first year was focused on that artifact question of like how do you build a system that doesn't fail you, um, how do you like decide what to do in order to um, make an analysis happen that works for you. And I, w I was really energized by like connecting these two things and being like, well, the way we can talk about it as a, c as a community is building systems that help you avoid errors and articulating what those errors are, putting costs with those errors, mm -hmm. um, and then making design decisions for your system around that. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of the struggle that we had was in terms of kind of identifying the constraints and identifying the frame, you know, the frame, kind of the framing of this problem. Yeah. Um, and otherwise, it's just, it's so open. open yeah, open. yeah, and like if you don't define this problem that way, um, from like kind of more first principles, you end up in these like nasty language wars, yeah. or you get people who are just saying like you should use it, you should use Knitter, and like, and you don't talk about why, mm -hmm. and it's like okay. When is it appropriate to use an editor? If you want to avoid these types of errors, like you don't want to update your data but have your report be stale, you know, like that's a huge one. And yep. so, being able to talk about the system that way, I think, was an important part of this kind of like thread of thought. Um, and so again, we kind of like separated out that, and I personally focused on that a lot. I mean, we both did, yep. but I think I like. That was in my head because of Etsy so much. And then by doing that, we kind of like, I kind of purposely like siphoned off the narrative building. And I was like, I don't want to talk about that. That seems really hard. Um, but then I feel like you ran with that a little bit. Well, first. First, you moved to San Francisco. First, yeah. So <laughs> I quit Etsy uh, and I moved to San Francisco. And just as kind of si aside, we do this, um, in the old days, we did this free advertising. And so one thing that happened in episode 22 was that I talked about a meditation class I was taking. So yeah. hit the clip. This is my very San Francisco free advertising where I'm taking a meditation class that I've really enjoyed. Oh. <laughs> and so it's this program called Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. Um, okay. And it's, it's like a whole thing. There's a Wikipedia. <laughs> it's a whole <laughs> that's thing. A, that's a whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, again, that's just kind of like a thing that popped up. Uh, didn't seem related at all, but um, ended up folding in later. So it just kind of like planting that seed now. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, like I was saying, you kinda, we kind of like siphoned off the, the 
the system design, which I think is a big part of like this conference and other R conferences of like, how do you do that? How do you do that in a way that is like user friendly? What types of tools enable you to do that? Um, but then that left this huge like, how do you convince someone of something, mm -hmm. essentially? Yeah. Um, and so you started to think about that a lot, and you had a really interesting episode um, where you were like preparing for a talk, right? I had to give a, a lecture. I got promoted to all the, all the full professors that get promoted at Hopkins give a lecture, and um, I had to give a talk, and I, wa and I wanted to kind of, I just wanted to play some music in the talk, <laughs> and so I had to kind of figure out some theoretical framework for like me being able to put audio clips into the, <laughs> it's a lecture, so I guess that's, I mean, it's a reasonable motivation. That's right, and another professor had, like, his entire lecture, he's a biostatistics professor, yeah. and his entire lecture was, like, talking about, like, a Wagner opera. Right, yeah. Ingo Rosinski, anyway. Like, no stats, anyway, yeah. so you had to, like... <laughs> so I, I started thinking about, you know, I, I've, I've had a long history of music, I've played the violin for now, however old I am, 30 some years, or that's not how old I am, but <laughs> <laughs> that's how long I've been playing. Um, and you know, I've studied music theory, I've done a lot of that kind of uh, work, and um, I, I just started thinking that there, there kind of were some connections between kind of what we do as data analysts and kind of how we think about music. Uh, and this is just a little bit of kind of what we talked about in that episode. Oops. Yeah. The more I thought about it, the more I felt like, um, there were kind of connections between what we do in data analysis, what, or not what we do, what we need in data analysis, and um, and kind of music theory, right? And mm -hmm. uh, and so the basic idea is that, you know, music is very is considered to be a very kind of subjective area, like you know, um, in terms of like what you think is good and what you think is not good, right? Um, mm -hmm. But that said, most of us have a sense of like what sounds good and what doesn't sound good. Right, and I think I talked a lot about kind of like there is a theory of harmony, there is a theory of melody, there is a th you know in terms of how to construct certain things, and it do and those rules don't produce you know the best music, but they do allow us to describe and to kind of um, summarize what it is that seem that people seem to like about music, and it's not a, an absolute you know theory. It's it's a very kind of based in culture and based in kind of uh, you know your in people's kind of collective ideas, but. Uh, there is a theoretical structure there. Yeah. And there's some, like, science to it, right? I mean, there's there's literally, like, wave properties. There is a little physics involved, yeah. Yeah, and then there's kind of, like, a psychology or something, you know, like, the, like, wanting to hear chords resolved, for example. Like, yeah. I'm not totally sure what, I don't know, I mean, I feel like I'm, like, I'm, like, Continue this thought, please. I well, don't know, you know much about So I, I got very deep in the weeds of this, <laughs> reading Arnold Schoenberg's Harmon Allier. And you know, the way he summarizes it, I think, in, in the best in the sense that the theory doesn't say what's right. The, th the theory says what's commonly done. OK. Um, yeah. and, and so the idea that the, you know, the five chord resolves to the one chord, that's not because it's right. It's just because that's what it seems to be what everyone does, and it seems to be kind of uh, you know, not too bad of an idea. Yeah. Um, but if you don't resolve the five chord to the one chord, it's not like a theoretical violation. Yeah. I'm just laughing because, uh -oh. <laughs> well, I, I'm just thinking about that second lecture uh, or the second keynote where he got like really defensive about pie charts. <laughs> and I think that's exactly, it's like, it's what people are doing. Like, yeah. Yeah. you can't argue with that. It is it's, commonly done. Yeah, and so, and it seems to work for, <laughs> I'm with him, like we're, for we're gonna, certain things. This is what happens in our podcast. Yeah, we get sidetracked. We get sidetracked, and then like two hours later, we end. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah. I'm just trying to illustrate that you were right. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, so okay. During this episode two, uh, I sort of bring up where my mind had been going because so at this point, I'd moved to Stitch Fix. And I had some like really amazing people I worked with in the product org who allowed me to participate more in product design. Um, one of the things was doing a design sprint, um, which is kind of a whole thing. But essentially, like I could see how design was working more closely. Um, and so hit the clip. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, because I was concurrently thinking about this, too, in terms of designers who I think actually have a very similar, like their place in an organization is very similar to a data, like they're usually kind of a cross-functional team, um, like horizontally integrated. And then you also have, um, like it's very problem solving focused, it's very focused on um, like, the, it's similar to like the consulting model. Um, 
But I think that they're more willing to talk about that connection. Like design is about the user and designing for a team. Like I feel like when you look at design conferences, it's a lot more focused on that. Um, but then also their products are on display. So I think that like sharing what people are doing is, is easier because you literally see, you know, design elements on websites when you go to them. Yeah. yeah. So I was thinking about design at the same thing. You're, same time you were thinking about music theory. Yeah. Um, I think we thought we were talking about different things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like two different ways of approaching this yeah. problem. Um, so kind of in the middle here, you know, I, ta I brought up like, like getting into meditation more. And then I essentially, like in the middle of all this, so I'm kind of reading about design. And one thing you see when you start to look into design more is they talk so much about empathy, um, empathy for the users. And like, um, like that's, that's like something that is just like an accepted fact about working in that field. Um, and so at the same time, I'm like getting more into meditation. I'm reading more kind of um, like connections between neuroscience and meditation. And so um, I read this like really dense Atlantic article <laughs> um, where it's a discussion between a neuroscientist and a Buddhist uh, monk. And they're talking kind of about like um, experiences. And so um, yep. why don't you like. Just to be clear, this episode, I read the transcript again. And I'm still not sure I understand <laughs> like, what, what I was we were talking about. Yeah. But. <laughs> Data analysis to influence decision making has to span both like the world where third person perspective and kind of this like scientific truth world is, and then also that like first person eliciting belief. <laughs> in another human when you can't really observe what will make that person start to believe your results and so or like trust it so anyway i just i thought it added clear to me it added some clarity of like how the complexity of what we do yeah so to set that up the idea was essentially that like Neuroscientists, they can study, in this case, they're talking about studying people who are meditated, and like, you can't exactly like, empirically observe like someone's in a meditative state, right? Like, you can measure their brain waves and stuff, but ultimately you have to rely on the person telling you that they're in that state, so you can like, correlate the brain waves with them having that state. And so, to me, it was like, kind of similar where, in order for an analysis to be successful, Someone has to be like, I get it now, you know? They have to tell you. It's yeah, they have to tell you that they get it, and you can't observe it. Like, you can, I mean, you can obviously see their face change or whatever, but like, it's, they're having like a first person experience. And so I was just like teasing apart, like, oh, yeah, you have to like use scientific methods and be in this world of science, but then also you have to like tap into this kind of like deeply empathetic thing of seeing where their mind is. And, that's hard. <laughs> I think I get it now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Good. <laughs> Do we have other clips from this episode? I don't think yeah. so. No. Yeah. Um, another thing, I think we might have a clip for this one, was talking about how blameless postmortems, like yeah. around the same time too, I started to see how blameless postmortems were. Well, let, why don't you just play yeah. the clip? I think the biggest thing I realized sort of almost right after was. Um, was that in some ways the um, the sort of blameless postmortem stuff is is a design process um, and it's a way of almost like making a system to force everyone to be empathetic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, the the point of the blameless postmortem is essentially to say you know here listen to. Listen to the problem, don't blame the user, like try to put yourself in their shoes. Like we force, they essentially force you, like you can't like use use statements or, you know, like there's a lot of stuff, a lot of kind of like rules of engagement. Um, and so like it all kind of like started to coming together. We're on the path. We're yes. on the path. Yeah. yeah. And the path ends at episode 63. Yeah. <laughs> or at least the first milestone. Yeah. Uh, which was the start. Some of you, if you were listeners, will remember the seven part book club that we had for Nigel Cross's design thinking. Yeah. Um, which some liked, and some <laughs> thought was too long. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. But we won't, yeah. Yeah. We'll, get, we'll, we'll talk about feedback later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so I'll play the clip here. Just so you know, 
the name of the clip. Oh, and this clip also really exemplifies the podcast for people who don't listen, where it takes us a little while to like get to the point. Yes. Um, In case you haven't already figured that out. Yeah. Um, the name of this file is all caps texting. All right. Oops, that's not what I was meant designed to do. There we go. And, and all I know is like I, I got these like messages that are like. I guess you took a picture of the Kindle with your phone and then yeah. like texted me the picture. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> That's that is correct. And so I'm like reading your photo of a Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you take a screenshot of a Kindle? I feel like I don't know. I've never is... owned one, so I'm not sure. Oh, oh, you're just like tablet all the way. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so then I'm reading these like screen these photos. They're not screenshots. They're photos of a screen. Yeah. Um, well, no. Okay. Photos of an e-ink screen. Yes. I, yeah. I do have a moment of pain when I see a photo of like a computer screen. Okay. Yeah. And then okay. Like, I think what 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 ensued was like a series of like all caps exchanges between you and me. <laughs> they were like, oh my god, I can't believe this is like exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No. It was like, oh, well, this articulates. What, <laughs> what we've been trying to say in like a few sentences versus, you know, you've written a series of long blog posts. And, I mean, I think those are so valuable. But, but not concise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I feel like this is the moment where, uh, you know, we were talking about these, well, this, I guess it was, the book's called Designly Ways of Knowing. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and we, we're kind of reading it, and she's sending me photos of the book, and I'm reading the book along with her, and I'm like, send me the next page, and you know. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and it was like, so this was a book essentially about the theory of, um, like academic theory around design and design work, and it was just like, to us it was this huge aha moment of like, oh, it's all starting to really make sense. Like, and what was making sense is that design, the way that designers work and the way that they structure the work, the way they talk about it, you could essentially like swap in the word data analysis and it was the same thing. In so many ways, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. so many ways. Um, like the way that designers talk about getting briefs where it's like, oh, you get a design brief and then the, you don't just, as a designer, you don't just do what the person asked you because that will be like a sub part. The person doesn't know what they want. Like, they have figured out some way to articulate it, but your job as a designer is to like zoom out and be like, identify what they actually need and then make the best solution about that. But like they're gonna communicate what they need via what they think the solution is. Right. And that's the same, I mean, I think about that all the time with like someone asks you for a number, you know? They're like, can you get me this number? And then you have to like, as a data analyst, you have to zoom out and be like, no, okay, what, what problem are you trying to solve? <laughs> like, why don't you catch me up on what you're doing and maybe I'm gonna solve this in a totally different way. Some of my collaborators, I think, would want me to just give them the number. I know, uh, yeah. But, uh, That's okay then. Yeah. <laughs> they don't stay collaborators for long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that sounded really like way darker than I meant it to be. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, just, I just stopped working with them. It's not like, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't want that. But, yeah. <laughs> but so that was that's kind of like the end of our um, audio clips. But like essentially we got to this place where it's like, okay, data analysis is a type of essentially like either an independent thing or a type of design thinking where it's like the answer to the student's question is essentially like adopt this whole other way of like approaching the world that's totally different than science. And we haven't like totally, as a field, we haven't totally like, like address that yeah. difference. I kind of wonder about, you know, what I would have told that student now, you know, more than 10 years later. Um, and uh, you know, I think the way that I kind of think about it is that when you go outside, you don't see a data analysis walking around, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't naturally occur like a tree or, uh, you know, uh, what else naturally occurs? A rock, right? <laughs> I only know about trees. Um, so if it, if it doesn't naturally occur, it has to be built by someone, or it has to be designed by someone, it has to be built. And so why shouldn't we use the same ideas there um, if, yeah. for a data analysis as for you might for a chair or a bridge or whatever? That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. and like, I mean, same with the music too, where, you know, like obviously noises exist, but like mm -hmm. crafting the noises in a way that's like pleasing is in many ways, a, even though it's art, it's also design, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, it's a good way of putting it. Like, essentially, you're constructing something. And then I also think what's interesting is that 
whether you're building like a production machine learning pipeline or you're building an analysis, like the tools are different, the types of testing you'll do is different, like kind of like the technical requirements are different, but ultimately you're doing the same thing, which is like you're creating something that's going to do something for someone. Right. <laughs> like either it's going to be a recommender system that creates recommendations for a website or it's like this analysis that some sort of person is going to consume and make a decision based on that. Might just be a PDF document. Yeah, it could be. An, I mean, even like an email, literally even an email yeah. with like one number in it is still. You have to decide like, okay, this problem is only this problem can be sufficiently addressed with an email, and that person doesn't need much context, and therefore, if I just send them to e the email, that'll be enough to like convince them to do something. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. And so. That put us on a really interesting path of like, okay, so if we think that data science is like a, a type of design, then how do designers work? Like, if you look at architects, how are they trained? If you look at you know other designers, how do they work in companies, et cetera? Um, and so one of the things in this um, design thinking book by Nigel Cross is talking a lot about like you just have to do it like over and over, um, and you're going to get better every time you do it. You're going to go through different thought processes, but you have to literally like exercise the part of your brain that does this constructive thinking rather than like the deductive thinking of science. So um, it's like, okay, so in data science, we kind of don't do that apprenticeship model so much. I mean, we, we, I think we wish we didn't have to, I guess <laughs> what it comes down to. Yeah, like <laughs> we wish we could just like teach the stuff and right. be done with it, because it, it's a lot of work to like go through someone's work yeah. and tell them if it's working or not. But ultimately, like if we kind of accept that this is a type of design and construction, then you need to be able to like practice it. Um, so we, we did some cool stuff with that where um, kind of like very different than uh, the types of challenges you do with like Kaggle and stuff where they're like, here's a data set, analyze it. Instead it was like, okay, let's say you had to build your system end to end. Like you needed to answer some question. We did like commute times. <laughs> right. Yeah, we talked about, well, your commute. I yeah, my commute. Yeah, so right. it was like in San Francisco, it's like I want to know exactly like how many minutes and the variance in those minutes um, for different commute methods so I can know like the last possible minute that I can leave my apartment <laughs> yeah. to make it to a meeting. And um, so it's like, okay, how would you solve that? Like, what, how would you ta get the data to solve that problem? How would you store it? How would you access it? How would you analyze it? How and would then, you display it? And then how would you model it? What are the fixed effects? What are the random effects? Exactly, you know, yeah. And, uh, it, it's, it's amazing how just a simple kind of formulation of a problem can bring in every single aspect of design, of analysis, you know, presentation, communication. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you're doing the whole thing. And what I like about it too is that like the things like w how you store the data is sort of on the same par as like what models you choose. Mm -hmm. Like all of those things are equal. You have to end up spending time on all of it yeah. instead of, um, I feel like as a field, and what I like about this conference is that less so here, but as a field, we focus so much just on the methods, and that really bothers me, <laughs> in case that hasn't been clear. <laughs> um, and I was actually, I was talking with someone last night about that, where I'm like, you know, in some ways, like, the way that like normal data science conference are um, structured, it's like everyone wants to talk about like the like the best method, like the latest thing. And literally in that system, you're motivated to have bad data because it like gives you more opportunity to do fancier models. And so like like any system where it's like oh okay like this person could work on worse and worse data and be like equally happy because they get to do like all these fancy things they learned at this conference is like. That's not solving the problem. Like that's that's like choosing not to solve the problem. Yeah. So by focusing on the whole thing, it's like no, okay. Like, can you hone in on exactly what data you need rather than just like making do with what might be like fa has fallen into your lap one way or another. I think one of the hardest things to do in, in general, but in, in also in data science, is to is to kind of uh, pull back from trying to maximize in a single direct, a single dimension. Yeah. Right. And I think and I. I to me, the way I interpreted even you know JJ's talk is like in their, the the way that corporations are structured is they maximize on a certain one dimension. Yeah. Um, and I think it's hard that can end up with some good and then some bad. 
And I think in data science, it's very tempting to kind of go for the optimal approach, go for the optimal method, go for the, you know, the best prediction. But there are other elements as other stakeholders or other trade-offs to be made. I really like that because <laughs> in the second talk, like, she just touched it briefly at the end, but it was like, what are UX problems and what are designer problems? And then the one that was like, this is actually a design problem was the loss function. Like it seems like it's just a data science problem, but that's actually like the core user experience is what loss function you use and like what system are you actually building? And what I like about that is that it's like the same with the corporation thing. It's like what was the loss function like before right. versus that? Like, it, yeah. like change the KPIs basically. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. I don't know, KPI, key performance indicator. I don't like, deal with KPIs. What? I don't deal with KPIs. Yeah, you don't deal with KPIs. Not yet, at least. I, um, <laughs> yeah, like the way I've been talking about that at Stitch Fix is like, yeah, how do we, rather than just like optimizing for sales, like how can we construct new KPIs that like might lead to different user experiences? Yeah. Part of me, I feel like it'd be great if we could move to a place where instead of saying this is the best thing, we could say, you know, I really appreciate this set of trade-offs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I like that. I don't know, but it doesn't quite, it doesn't sound as nice, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, I think it sounds, okay. anyway. Well, you're, I know that uh, I have one person with me here. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other thing that kind of like the end of this timeline, this has just been briefly, but like essentially by getting to this place, now it opens up like a whole nother set of um, fields to look into, which is everything around creativity, so like, like all of, like the book I'm mentioning that we're mentioning here is called The Creative Curve. Um, and we had like a one episode uh, book we club on that. Learn our lesson. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was actually about to suggest that we should do more. Okay. I was like, let's retroactively go back and do like three episodes on that one. Anyway. Um, but the, the idea with that was that it was someone, this guy, Alan Gannett, who like essentially empirically studied creative people um, and how they operate. Uh, and I thought it was awesome. I mean, I really liked it. It really made me feel like, oh, I can apply these principles to my data science work. Um, and the principles were, let's make sure we, did I, did I, write, I don't think I did ever write consumption. them Consumption. Yeah, so there was consumption. Yeah. So creative people will frequent, like, people who, well, this is why I'm confused with you. So like people who are like engaged in movie making, they watch movies like 20% of the time. Like, right. <laughs> you're not like that for whatever reason. That's like a different story. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, you look at, like just again from like empirically looking at people who are in these creative fields, um, consuming other people's work is a big part of it. And like you digest it, you think about it, um, and yeah. like you iterate on it. And I think that, the, that aspect, I mean, if you, if you want to write, you read a lot of books. If you, you, know, yeah. you want to write music, you listen to a lot of music. And one of the aspects that's difficult about data analysis is that always easy to read a lot of data analyses. Yeah. Because we don't, they're not out there. Yeah, Even, especially in the corporate world, like data yeah. science specifically, like, you can read, if you have a big team, you can read what other people are doing, but otherwise, right. like, basically only at conferences. Right. Or yeah. David Robinson's live stream. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's hard to consume a lot of data analysis, is, I think is what it comes down to, and I think that's a key step to becoming expert in something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's um, a great point, yeah. Iteration. Iteration, yeah. So, is there imitation too? Iteration. Iteration, yeah. Yeah, so iteration is this idea that you just like keep going. Like you keep trying things, you do it over and over. Um, and again, that kind of is touched in the design literature too, where it's just like you gotta keep, you gotta keep doing things. Yeah. And ideas are gonna evolve over time. Um, and that's w part of why we wanted to go through those clips and put up this timeline is that even like the creativity that we got from this podcast that I totally wasn't expecting. Right. Like, it took us four years. Like, this timeline is over, like, four, over yeah. four years. Timeline's not to scale. Yeah, it's definitely not to scale. And so it just, it's like, the number of ways that we attacked this problem and thought about it was, like, a lot. And it, it, never, it never felt like it was work, necessarily. It right. was just, like, iterating yeah. and going on. And then there's the community. Yeah, so the community one, another one is like creative communities. And so you look at artists and like um, Andy Warhol, right, had like the factory, I think, and where it was just like a bunch of artists and a loft, you know, like painting, giving feedback, everything. And so with that, essentially it's like surrounding yourself with other creative people helps you be creative. Um, and so that's kind of like, you know, I feel like my um, sitcom, like happy ending here, it's like, 
coming to conferences like this, you know, they're fun, they're energizing, and I do think they kind of embody this, this creative community, especially because so many people are isolated as data scientists. Like, not every company has like 100 data scientists. Most companies don't. And so being able to like get together and bounce ideas off and see what other people are doing, like, like I guess what I'm trying to say is that is the work. Like, it's not like this isn't productive, right. if that makes sense. I, if there was one agenda item for, the, for starting the podcast, I think it, part of it was to produce kind of that community for people who may be sitting in a department somewhere or in a company somewhere by themselves. They're forced to be the, the lone data analyst, and yeah. they don't have anyone to talk to, or they don't have the ability to kind of hear what other people are working on and how they're approaching it, things like that. So Yeah, and that's actually, that's like, some of the most meaningful feedback I hear is when people are like, oh yeah, I'm like, I'm like alone. And it's like really nice to be able to hear how other people are working. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah, that makes me feel really good. So. So, and then feedback. Feedback, yeah. <laughs> so feedback, and this one is, is definitely hard, where like a, a big part of, in this kind of creative curve book and just in general with design, like you, you actively are soliciting user feedback all the time, right? And that's a huge part of it and you cannot be attached to what you've produced, essentially. Like you have to let the users tell you what to do. And I think that that is like extremely hard. Yeah. <laughs> like getting feedback is hard. Yeah. And um, Definitely not something that people are trained to do, right? No, yeah. Um, and so, and then I feel like, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe it's just curmudgeonly because I'm in, like I see it the most, but like I feel like, especially in like academic stats and in data science in general, like the, like people do take it really personally. Like there's that quote that I kind of hate where it's like, photographers and statisticians both fall in love with their models. <laughs> 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 I feel bad, for, like, but it, it makes the point that, yeah. like, <laughs> like, you see people, like, really dig their heels in, and they're, and it's, like, it, it just, it gets personal, yeah. and what I like is that, at least with the user, like, I think in the design field, there's a lot more focus on that, on that, like, accepting feedback, um, and then also, I mean, another thing, kind of, like, personal, Hillary's, like, personal corner of, like, the one thing that did, the one thing I did not expect from starting this kind of meditation practice and going down that path is that it genuinely made me better at getting like empathy and getting feedback because essentially like the whole practice, the whole idea is like dissociating yourself from who you think you are. So like it allows you to not feel personally threatened if someone challenge like People take stuff personally when it's like your whole identity is that you're a statistician and you're smart, right? And then if someone says your model is wrong, it's like, oh no, I'm not smart anymore. My whole identity is like gone. And then you're like defensive, right? And so like figuring out ways, and for me like meditation, and, but like just figuring out ways to like detach yourself from that makes you able to take feedback and then that actually makes you better at the thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like a paradox. And it, but it's not like a magical thing, it's something that can be practiced. Exactly, yeah. so yeah, like the thing, the thing about the meditation practice that was a big paradigm shift for me was that these things aren't just like fixed properties. It's not just like, oh, this person's good at getting feedback or this person has a thick skin and like that's a set character trait and mine is not and that's done. It's like, no, there are ways to like, to essentially engage in practice that makes you more robust to that. And, and like, you know, again, like looking at kind of like the neuroscience and Buddhism stuff, it's like, you know, you can, you're, you have like neuroplasticity and you can like make new neural pathways that like make this stuff, like it's not just like, oh yeah, like I swear, like there, there are ways that you can like essentially change your brain. Um, and actually the design, the design, the Nigel Cross stuff goes into that of like, you know, you look at people who are cab drivers and like their spatial regions of their brains are like much more developed, right. you know. Yeah. So, yeah, like doing creative work is hard and it's very different than doing scientific work mm -hmm. and it's also what we're doing. Right. <laughs> and there are ways to get good at it. You know, yeah. like there's ways to practice it, there's ways to get good, like doing this whole podcast, you know, it's like being okay with like, iterating and showing things that will be wrong in the future is like, it's, it's okay. And actually it'll make you better. Um, 
And that's kind of why I feel like I've wanted to talk so much about the design thinking is because I want people to feel empowered to engage in that part of honing their craft um, in, and not feeling intimidated by it. Like, I think probably a lot of people in this room, like, don't think they're creative. Like, I didn't think I was creative. And, and I don't think that, like, I... Yeah, it's just, like, identity. It's like, I'm a scientist. Yep. Hillary does science, math and science. And I want people to go through that same process I went through of, like, opening up that side of myself and being like, oh, like, this stuff all makes me better at this work, and it's more fun yeah. because of it. And, like, you can do it, too. Like, anyone can do it. <laughs> so... <laughs> anyway, that was like sitcom ending. There we go. Yeah. Except that we do have one piece. We have one more, yeah. So that was like big recurring theme. We have one more recurring theme that we are not open to feedback on. That's right. So um, we have one piece of, this is the only data in our whole. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you did make this in R, right? So we do have R in this talk. Uh, there is R, yeah. Yeah. This is a Perfect. GG plot, actually. So yeah. we have one more clip. Now we're bringing tea time to the internet, right? So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I don't actually have tea today, though. But I've also gotten into coffee now, so no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I, maybe I'll bring. It'll be coffee time. Nah, that's, <laughs> that doesn't sound that right. Doesn't <laughs> so. Uh, so yeah, lead up to that was that this podcast in part was we. I went to grad school where Roger was a professor and we had this tea time thing and that's, we had all these conversations, enjoyed them. Yeah. And then it was like, oh no, I'm into coffee. Yes, yeah, so we, we can no longer have tea time. Yeah. This is, uh, this is where Hillary switches. Yeah. And it really did. It really was post grad school because yes. this is a long rant, but like. <laughs> yep. <only> most, <laughs> most of my life I had bad coffee. Okay. Like, it's, yes. like, I think we all. Yeah. Someone was from another, the, the, um, the guy from Australia was like talking about how it's like an experience yeah. to have like bad diner coffee. That's it's right. like, oh, you come to America, you have like burnt diner coffee. It's like, it's like so bad, it's good. Only in America. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so let me just explain, on the x-axis is episode number. On the y-axis is number of mentions of the word coffee. Yeah. Uh, it's good to have transcripts. So yeah. thank you, Stringer Package. Um, <laughs> So Hillary switches to tea to coffee. This is in episode 36 is where I say people shouldn't talk about drinking things on podcasts. Yeah, like you go uh, on a kind of long rant yeah. about listening to other podcasts and the fact that they're like talking about the bourbon they drink. That's right. And you were like, that doesn't belong on a podcast. Right. Like you were harsh. Because I thought you were saying people shouldn't actively be drinking alcohol on a yeah. podcast. Yeah. And you're like, no, no, no. Like talking about the bourbon. Yeah. It's really annoying. People yeah. Do. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so, so since then. You know, we can't say cause and effect here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, the number of instances has gone up. Has gone time. up. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So literally. The, this will be the hill we die on. Though. Yeah. <laughs> and like the last piece of follow up is that I, based on feedback, I was open to it. I got this mocha pot to make coffee. That's right. And I literally couldn't give it away. Like, we had a whole episode That's right. about, like, if anyone here wanted it, like, I'm willing to give it away, and no one emailed us. That's right. No one wants the mocha <laughs> No pot. one wants the mocha pot. Yeah. So. So. And then last night, we got some more feedback about a new device. That's right. To try, episode so. 102. Yeah. We'll talk about, yeah. So, so anyway, yeah, so if you don't like coffee, like, don't talk to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. It's like, <laughs> we're going to keep on going. Yeah. But, yeah, so... Anyway, actually, you know, I did have a tie-in for this. I was thinking about it where, like, to the Soulcraft as, um, shop class as Soulcraft, where it's kind of like you just have to do stuff. Like, I, I started making coffee, and then I want to talk about it more. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, mm -hmm. the more that you do something, like, you can kind of fall in love with anything, and you just have to do it a bunch, yeah. and you start to care about it. So, again, it's like the, to the creativity, it's like just, just start trying, and you'll start to like it more. And you'll start to feel more empowered to talk about it. And then you'll bother everyone around you yeah. by talking about it way too much. And then, uh, and then you'll do a keynote at our studio. And then you'll yeah. do a keynote on yeah. it. So. Anyway, so that's our episode. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Uh, and thanks to our studio comp for having us here. Yeah. <laughs>